Hello, young people. A little later than I wanted to be, but I'm going to get this done, and hopefully you'll be able to go over it um, when we get finished. So we're going to be talking about the ideal gas law. Now, the ideal gas law is really interesting because we have some assumptions that we make about an ideal gas. Now, we were talking about this earlier, about the difference between an ideal gas and a real gas, and we're about to get some answers. So this is a model of how we would like gases to behave. It's obviously not perfect, but it kind of does give us a pretty good assumption about what's going to happen with gases. So the first thing that we assume is that the volume of individual particles is negligible. It's assumed to be zero, so each particle has no volume. That's not really true. But in an ideal situation, we don't worry about the volume of each individual particle. We only worry about the volume of all the particles together. Particles are always in constant motion, and the collision of those particles are what's causing the pressure exerted by the gas. So we're assuming that particles are always moving and that the pressure is assumed by that. Particles are assuming, assumed to exert no force on each other, so we're not uh, accounting for any of the collisions that they might have with each other. We're only counting the collisions that they have with the container. Okay, fourth thing is, the average kinetic energy is assumed to be directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. So we're assuming the amount of energy that these things contain is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. These all assumptions come in to give us the basis of the ideal gas or the ideal gas law. Real gases do have finite volumes. That means we can't just assume that they have infinite volumes. It doesn't really matter. Um, we know that they have finite volumes, and we do know they exert forces on each other. Um, we saw that with our syringes, our real versus our ideal gas. Um, so we know that intermolecular forces do kind of account for some things, but in a lot of situations, most gases behave ideally. We'll get more about this a little bit later, and it really has to do with the size of the gas more than anything. Um, but these are the assumptions that we make if we have an ideal gas. So. If we're looking at Boyle's Law from the perspective of an ideal gas, we know that P is equal to 1 over V, right? So if we add the idea that we're keeping constant number of moles, we're keeping constant temperature, then we get that. That's a pretty simple statement. So what do we know happens to pressure as volume decreases? Does this align with the assumption made by the kinetic molecular theory? Does it align with what we said? Well, we said that, you know, as volume decreases, the pressure should increase, right? And that makes sense because as I'm pushing those particles closer and closer together, they're going to be hitting the sides of the container more and more because I'm pushing them closer together. So that makes sense, right? So NRT is considered a constant. So in no-names law, some people call it no-names law, it's Gay-Lussac's law. Gay-Lussac's law says... P is equal to NRV over T, where the number of moles and the volume are kept constant, and we're moving pressure and temperature. So what do we know? What happens to pressure is temperature increases. As temperature goes up, pressure goes up. So does this align with the kinetic molecular theory, what we were talking about before, this idea of an ideal gas? And we have to say, yeah, because as the temperature goes up, that means the average kinetic energy goes up. That means they're moving faster, colliding more with the, um, with the sides of the container. So sure, that makes complete sense. So the idea that NRV, the part that is in that dark teal color, that's a constant, okay? So we're looking at all of the laws that we just talked about from the perspective of this, this kinetic molecular theory idea of an ideal gas, okay? Next is Charles' Law. When well, we know Charles' Law relates uh, volume and temperature, and we know it's V divided by T, but if we put it in a formula, we know that V times some constant is equal to T. Now, if you look at this, this is also the equation of the line. So if we go back to all of these situations, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back for just a second. If we go back to Boyle's Law, this is the equation that we would get from the line. And the constant is the slope of the line. It's a pretty simple process. Same thing here. This is the equation we would get from a line. And the constant is the slope of that line. So when we have a straight line equation, we can get a slope. So here we go. So 
and R over P, where P, the pressure is kept constant, the number of moles are kept constant, that's a constant. Does this happen? Do we understand that in the kinetic molecular theory that volume should get bigger if temperature gets bigger? Well, yeah. Um, more motion if the container is flexible, then we should be able to do that because the container is flexible. That means the pressure is not going up. So the container has to get bigger in order to accommodate for those collisions that are going to be increasing. How do we keep pressure constant while we increase temperature? Hey, we can't have a container that is solid. We have to have a container that can expand. Okay, does this align by assumptions? Yeah, of course it does. We just said that. Because if the container expands, then the collisions are not producing greater pressure. They're producing greater volume because it's making the expanding container go up. Avogadro's law. Now, we know that that is a uh, number of moles in volume. So what do we have? Volume is equal to this constant times the number of moles. Well, what's the constant? The constant is the slope of the line. So it's the slope of the line, but it's also a constant because it's the slope of the line. So how do we keep pressure and temperature constant? Well, we increase the number of moles of particles. Well, we don't increase the temperature. We don't increase the pressure. The volume has to change. We have to have a flexible container. Does that meet the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory and this idea of an ideal gas? And the answer is, sure it does. The more particles we put in there, the bigger the volume has to be to keep temperature and pressure constant. Otherwise, we have things interacting, creating different pressures and temperatures. But that would be volume being constant. So the ideal gas law, simply put, puts all of that together. So you'll see PV. PV is part of Boyle's law. So the PV part is the Boyle's law part. The NRT, well, N is clearly from Avogadro's but the R is a constant, and the R is something that we have to keep in there because at ideal, or STP, I'm sorry, at STP, these constants were, con this constant was developed. So we are at STP, what should happen, given all of this thing, and that, that's where that comes from. So P is pressure, V is volume, it must be in liters, not milliliters, not centimeters cubed, um, must be liters, but remember centimeters cubed and milliliters are the same thing. CCs and MLs are exactly the same. N is the number of moles. R is the universal gas constant. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And T is temperature and it must be in Kelvin. It must be Kelvin temperature. When we're talking about gases, temperature must be converted to Kelvin always, 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 always. So what is R, the ideal gas constant, the universal gas constant? Well, um, it is basically this idea that we are at standard temperature, 273 Kelvin, standard pressure, one atmosphere or 101.3 kPa or 600 millimeters of mercury or tor. And at one SDP, one mole is equal to 22.4 liters. So we know all of this information. So what we did is we put all this information into a calculator and we came up with this R, this constant that we have to have to make everything work in an ideal situation. Um, so that the kinetic molecular theory will work, everything will work together. R, remember, is kind of that slope fix, um, that, that thing that fixes the way things are working. So when we're looking at R, R is just a constant. It's something that's going to always stay the same. So when we looked at each of the individual laws, we saw things combining with that constant, that R. But those were the things that were going to remain the same all the time. And so the others were able to change. And so we get this. So R values could be different because we can have kPa, we can have atmospheres, and we can have millimeters of mercury. So if you have pressure in atmospheres, you have 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres divided by mole Kelvin. Excuse me, I'm moving myself because I'm looking for something um, to rely on here. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and then if you have another gas constant, pressure is in millimeters of mercury. Guess what that gas constant is? 62.4 liters times millimeters of mercury divided by moles times degree Kelvin or times Kelvin. If pressure is in kPa, what do we have? We have um, 8.31 liters times kPa divided by moles Kelvin. Now, don't panic. I don't want you panicking here. You know why I want to be panicking? Do you remember this beautiful sheet right here? This beautiful sheet right here, if you look right here on this sheet, it has gas law constants. And every single one of these constants is listed right here on this green sheet. And guess what you can use? Guess what you can use on all your tests? Guess what you can use on all your homework? Guess what you can use on the AP test? This sheet. This is what is given to you on the AP test. So you don't have to memorize the universal gas law constants. 
Now, when I was younger, I did have to memorize them a little bit. Just a little bit, okay? So, you know, to, is it okay? Yeah, you can memorize some things, but I would just memorize one if I'm gonna memorize. But since they're on a chart, I don't have to memorize them. I can just use them. It's no big deal. Um, so, I can use all three different ones, or I can just for, convert everything to a single pressure. I usually end up converting to atmospheres. Um, I use atmospheres most. Um, I know atmospheres are 1 to 101.3 or 1 to 765 millimeters of mercury. So it seems to be really easy to convert to that. And I can remember the um, uh, 0.821 um, on your sheet, it's 0 0.8206 you know, here nor there. Um, but your sheet has it, so you can use it. I don't think I'd worry too much about it. I would make sure I knew that my gas law constant was based upon my pressure unit. So look for your pressure unit. If your pressure unit is in atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, or KPA, you're golden. If it's not, then you have to convert to one of those. So make sure you have an understanding. Typically, on the AP test, they're gonna stick to millimeters of mercury, TOR, and atmospheres. Um, if they threw in KPA because it's not on your sheet, they would probably give you some information about that. Your sheet also contains information that STP is 273.15 Kelvin and one atmosphere, and ideal gas at STP is 22.4 liters per mole. So all of that is on this little sheet right here. It also tells you um, the units that are used here. So you'll see me use some of these. So some of these uh, variables are also listed on your green sheet on that upper right hand uh, quadrant on page four of your green laminated sheet. So don't panic, okay? You'll also find in the upper left hand column, you'll find some equations about gas laws. So those two top quarters tell you about gas laws, okay? So no panicking. So PV equals NRT. This is our ideal gas law. So. Straight ideal gas law problems sprinkled all over the AP test. Another way just to get to moles, because remember, N is moles. That's what it means. And I probably should go back and fix that because the N is capitalized because the font that I'm using is doing that, but I'll take care of that in a minute. Um, so if I can get to moles, then I can use stoichiometry. So got moles, I'm gonna do some stoichiometry, but that's in the next lecture. You don't have to panic about moles right now or doing any stoichiometry. The problems you're gonna be doing in this, uh, this second problem set are simply ideal gas law problems, PV equals NRT problems, and variations of PV equals NRT problems that we could do. And you'll see all of that in just a minute. So got moles, do stoichiometry, that's, that's what we do. So we can throw gas law problems in anywhere. You can throw them in on the free response. You can throw them in anywhere because you can get to moles. If you can get to moles, then you can do some stoichiometry. If you can do some stoichiometry, you can find something else. So just remember, it's a pretty easy way to do that, okay? So sample problem one, let's look at sample problem one. Sample problem one says for an ideal gas, calculate the pressure of gas if a 0 0.215 moles occupies 30, 338 milliliters at 32 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we need to do, very first thing we need to do is first of all, let's get a pen. Um, I'm gonna be using my, pen, uh, my finger again because I still haven't gotten my little stylus yet because I don't know. Anyway, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna change my temperature to Kelvin. So 273 plus 32 and that's five zero, carry the one that's 305 Kelvin. So now I've got Kelvin. Um, it doesn't really matter which one of these you, we use because we're looking for pressure. So we know PV is equal to NRT. So if we rearrange it a little bit, we know that P is equal to NRT over V. Okay, pretty simple so far. So we start plugging in. So we have 0 0.25, 215 moles times R, well, R is the gas constant. I'm just going to use 0821. And remember, oops, I don't know why that keeps doing that on my computer, but it does keep doing that. Okay. So 0 0.0821 atmospheres, um, liters, moles, Kelvin 
times 305 Kelvin. Be careful in your calculator because you can mess up, mess up these up. Make sure you're using parentheses here because you're multiplying and dividing multiple things. And if you don't, you will divide by one thing but not the other thing and multiply it and it gets a little complicated. So V, V right here, milliliters, so I gotta change that to liters, that's 0 0.338 liters. Notice what happens here. Moles here, cancel out with moles there. Liters here, cancel out with liters here. Kelvin here, cancels out with Kelvin here. What am I left with? I'm left with atmosphere. So my unit is gonna be ATM. That's a pressure unit, that's good. And I do my calculation, and because I have two significant figures right here, um, I get 15.9, but I'm going to say 16 ATM. That's what my answer is right there. Okay, pretty simple. All right, let's go on to the next one, see if we can solve it. Problem number two. In a gas thermometer, the pressure needed to fix the volume of 0.2 grams of helium at 0.5 liters is 113.30 kPa. What is the temperature? So we don't know what the temperature is. That's pretty good. Um, we have grams. So the first thing that we could do right here is go ahead and change grams, 0 0.20 grams, divided by 4 grams per mole. And I'm going to get, let's see, that's 2 divided by 4. That's 0.5. Let's see. Yeah, 0 0.05. We get 0 0.05 moles. Once again, there's that crazy line, that crazy line, that crazy line. Okay, let's try this again. So I divided that, 0 0.05 moles, okay? So that's my number of moles. So let's go, PV is equal to NRT. I'm looking for that guy, so I wanna get it by himself. So T is equal to PV divided by NR. So I start plugging in. Well, I have 113.30 kPa, okay, times V, which is 0 0.50 liters, divided by N. N appears right here, 0 0.05 moles. There's my line again, sorry guys. And then R, because I have kPa and I look up R, R is equal to, where is it at? There it is, 8.31, 8.314. I don't know why it just keeps doing that craziness that is just irritating me really badly. Hang on, let me see. Okay, let's try it again. It's really getting on my nerve. 314, um, it's kPa times liters over moles, Kelvin. Okay, so moles are gone, they're right there. Liters are gone right there, kPa, kPa. I've got Kelvin on the bottom of two, so that means I'm gonna end up with units of Kelvin, that's good. So I multiply this, divide it by this multiplied together, and I'm gonna get an answer of 140 Kelvin. So that's my answer right there, okay? It's really not hard. It's a manipulation of the problem, manipulation of the, of the formula, and then you plug the numbers in. You have to know, or you always know, because it's on your green sheet, you have to know three of the four of the constants to be able to solve it. Now there's a little something though that we're gonna add to it, and it has to do with that N factor. So. Oh, I did this because I was going to redo it with another thing. Don't worry about it. We're going to go on. So N is really interesting because the grams of a gas, how could we use that with PV equals NRT? Well, we, we got to know that molar mass is equal to mass divided by the number of moles. Remember, when we do stoichiometry, we take the mass of something and divide it by the molar mass. Now, I'm using MM as molar mass. On the AP exam, they use a bolded M um, for mass, so just be aware of that. It's on the sheet, so you make sure you understand that. So if that's that, and that equals number of moles, then rearranging that a little bit, mass divided by moles is equal to the molar mass. Huh, that could be pretty interesting. I can probably use that a little bit. I could probably substitute this in for the number of moles. 
huh, I wonder if I could do that. Let's see. So n is equal to mass divided by molar mass, which we got. So let's see if we can work on that problem. So we, this, we got this right up here. We, we kind of already knew that um, based upon our stoichiometry. But we can sub that in because n is equal to that. So if we're asked to find molar mass, I would probably use this factor that the number of moles is equal to mass divided by the molar mass from my stoichiometry understanding, and then move from there. So let's look at sample three. Calculate the molar mass of a gas sample which has a mass of 3.11 grams in a 225 milliliter vessel at 55 degrees Celsius and 886 millimeters of mercury. So the first thing I'm gonna do is 273 plus 55, that's eight, uh, no, carry the one, that's two. Carry the one, that's 328 Kelvin. That's a good thing. Now, this is where we're going to have a little bit of complication because I'm going to take you through the steps of plugging in the formula. So we know that PV is equal to NRT. We know we're going to replace N. So um, PV is equal to mass divided by the molar mass R. T. What am I solving for? I'm solving for the molar mass. So this needs to go it to the top. Oh, silly line again. Okay, silly line because I had to put a line over the T. So molar mass is what we're trying to get on the top. So I'm going to move molar mass here because I'm going to multiply both sides by the molar mass. So I'm going to get molar mass times PV is equal to MRT, M meaning the mass. So now molar mass by itself, that means PV have to come over here. So I'm going to get that the molar mass is equal to mass RT divided by PV. It's just a manipulation of the same equation. All I did was I changed N for this. I exchanged those two things. So I just put an equal, equal, equalization there. So. Let's go to the next slide here because, oops, nope, let's not go to the next slide. I thought I had another one of those in there. So I'm going to start plugging in. What am I going to plug in? It's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to put 0.311 grams. That's the mass. R, I've got millimeters of mercury, so I'm going to be using 62.4 millimeters of mercury times liters over moles times Kelvin, right? T, I have 328 Kelvin, 328K, okay, divided by P is 886 millimeters of mercury, okay, sorry, you can't see the 8 there, and then the volume, I've got to change that to liters, so 0.225 liters, liters, okay, so let's look at our units, millimeters of mercury there, cancel out, liters, cancel out. Kelvin, cancel out. What's left? Grams over moles. Hey, that's the unit of molar mass, grams per mole, right? So we do all our calculations and we end up, because we have two sig figs right here, we end up with 32 grams per mole. Relatively simple when you think about it. The complication is subbing, subbing it in, okay? You guys can do it though, it's not a big deal. So manipulation of the ideal gas law. Another one, how can we manipulate the ideal gas law? So here we go, PV equals NRT, right? So if N is equal to this, so that PV is equal to mass times molar mass times RT. Hey, that looks pretty good. I think that, that we already did that. So sample, oh, I forgot to do something. Something's not kosher. We already did this problem. Sorry about that, okay? So I, got, I had it a little out of order, so I meant to show you this, this thing first so you could get there, okay? Um, so make sure you look at that again. Stop the, stop the video and look at that and make sure you understand that, okay? Okay, manipulation of gas laws number two. So here we go. This is what we know. I'm just using shorter letters, okay? No big deal, I'm not using mass N, molar mass, I'm just using M and MM. Okay, so we've got that. So if MM times PV, so I'm solving for MM again, so we see what we did, and MM is equal to M times R times T divided by P times V, which we know, we got that from our other equation. And density is equal to mass times volume, divided by volume. Hang on, hang on. 
So if I take these two components and put them together, look what I get. I get density. Once again, crazy lines. I don't need crazy lines. Just do what I'm asking you to do, machine. Okay, so I get density. So what am I going to do? I'm going to sub m, m over v for d. And I'm going to get this equation. Molar mass is equal to density times r times t over p. And all I'm doing is using the number of moles and what I know about the number of moles, uh, mass divided by the molar mass. Mass divided by volume is density and solving for that. So let's look at a problem like that. So the density of a gas was measured at 1.5 atmospheres and 27 degrees Celsius and found to be 1.95 grams per liter. Calculate the molar mass. Okay, so the first thing, remember, I've got to do 273 plus 27. Let's see, that's 10, carry the 1, that's another 10, carry the 1, that's 300 Kelvin. Okay, so we've got that. Let's go back for just a second to our problem here. Here's our equation, right? We just developed that equation. And the equation came from right here, where this is equal to the number of moles, N, right? So let's use that. So we know that MM is equal to D times R times T over P. Okay, so plug it in. Density, 1.95 grams per liter. R, it's in atmosphere, so we're going to put, use the point 0, 0.0821 atmospheres, liters, moles, Kelvin, I'm sorry, moles, it's not doing it very easily, Kelvin, times, and I'm going to squeeze it in, times 300, okay, okay, divide all of that by P, P is right there. 1.50 atm so atmospheres are going away k is going away liters are going away and i'm left with grams per mole hey that's my molar mass again right and when i calculate that i get 32 grams per mole there's my answer okay so it's just a manipulation of the ideal gas law and it will do this it can do this as a matter of fact um, the molar mass idea is going to come up because in our next lab that we're going to be doing, we're going to be calculating molar mass um, from this information. So you need to be thinking about what do I need to know in order to find the molar mass from the ideal gas law. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry, this is a little long today.